That's a, uh, that's a very interesting shirt you're wearing there, Carl. Yeah, I know. If only there was some way you could buy it for a reasonable price online. Ah, oh, it's really hot. Extras in TV shows and movies are basically just window dressing, in that they only really exist to show you, the audience, that the thing you're watching isn't completely devoid of life. Sometimes, though, extras offer a subtle clue about the state of the universe they live in. For example, in Star Trek The Next Generation, the way some extras dress shows us, the audience, that there is complete equality between the sexes. How does just an extra, like, background dressing for a scene, yes. of all things, show there's equality between the sexes? Well, if, like me, and you're a huge-ass nerd who's watched all of Star Trek The Next Generation, if you watch very closely, you will notice in the background of some, but not all, episodes, you will occasionally see male members of, like, you know, the Enterprise wearing what, like, we would understand to be a dress, but isn't in the Star Trek universe known as a scant. So what actually is a scant? It's one of the uniform options people working aboard the Enterprise have and it can be worn by either male or female cadets at their own discretion. And the fact that you see male like, cadets wearing it is a subtle indication that, in the future of that universe, gendered clothing is no longer a thing. Before we continue as well, Brad, can we both agree that that guy is fucking killing it? Because he's accessorised his scant with like, this sick-ass pair of leather boots, man. That guy, is like, he's catwalk ready. It looks like he's shaved his legs as well. He wants to present them in the best possible way. Yeah, of course way. he is. And that's like, I love that idea of that. Just this one background extra shows you like, oh yeah, in this universe, no one gives a fuck about wearing a dress. So why would we? Like, we've got an alien on board who's like our head of security and he's got like weird forehead ridges. Why would you give a fuck if you're wearing a dress? As long as you're wearing the same uniform as everyone else, I don't give a shit. We can see the inverse a lot. And like, as a lot of the women choose to wear, like, you know, the standard, like, you know, iconic leotard, but there are others who wear the dress. And I like that the indication there is that you have a choice, and, like, some men just choose to wear the dress because maybe they're, like, free-balling it. It reminds me a lot of the stories you've probably heard, like, around summertime. And they come around, like, in the UK, they come around every year. I'm not sure if it happens in America, but a lot of schools in the UK have very strict dress codes, and usually a school uniform. And every year during summer, or, like, a heat wave, there will be a story, and it's one of my favourite stories, and it'll be, like, a young lad or a group of young lads are sick and tired of their ball sticking to the inside of their leg and they'll come in wearing a dress. Because obviously a dress is much more suitable for hot weather and you will always see like, the Daily Mail or something like losing their shit at the idea of boys wearing a dress. And they'll interview the boys and they'll say, well, it's hot and I'm playing football and I don't want to run around in black trousers that have no give. It, uh, you want to see like the overhead kicks I can do in this fucking dress. <laughs> and I love that idea. It's, the fact that in the statue, you know, they've broken down, like, you know, that arbitrary barrier between the sex, like, why can't a man wear a dress? It, like, it's just an item of clothing. It is something I find quite fascinating, though, because having, like, fabric draped around your waist... Um, There's nothing inherently female about it, yeah, is Yeah, like, because kilts are seen as being quite manly. Yeah. Um, well, that's, that's because you've got to wear... If you want to wear a proper kilt, you'll have a dagger with it as well. well you, do, you have a sword and a dagger. Yeah, the dagger's got, in the sock and the yeah. sword's in the waist. That's, that's when you know... You're ready for like things. I want to see people in the Star Trek universe doing that. It's a dagger in there. Like that guy, Joe, the guy behind me now, if he had a dagger in his leather boot, I'd be like, yeah, that's a fucking badass right there. So that's, I would not me make him head of security. Fuck Worf. But it's like we used, um, back in uh, ancient Greece or ancient uh, Rome, they used to wear like the uh, togas and yeah. the robes and stuff. Because making trousers was a fucking ball ache. Like literally, because obviously the trousers that they made were like that really rough seam straight down the middle that had just split you from your. Like, you dick to your asshole. But it's just baffling how ingrained it is in society that articles of clothing can be seen as not suitable for someone because they're not the right sex for it. Well, the thing is, colours are as well. Yeah. Like, pink for girls, blue for boys, but the, like, the famous fact of that is if you go back 100 years, it was actually reversed, and pink was seen as the more manly colour. Because obviously it's, made, it's red, so that's just like slightly lighter. But obviously that switched around at some point in history. And despite the fact that 100 years ago it was the manliest colour, today you will have men who will refuse to wear pink because they see it as being girly. And that's the old adage, isn't it, of like, it takes a real man to wear pink. Because you have to be so completely secure in your masculinity that you don't care what other people think. I, I think we can all agree, like, nothing exudes more confidence than, like, the man who's just, like, wearing a dress and doesn't give a fuck. We've talked before, haven't we, about David Bowie? Yeah. When David Bowie's like, you know what, fuck it, I'd wear dresses now. And walks around with it. There's um, Noel Fielding as well, isn't there? Like, he sometimes comes out wearing a dress. And because obviously he's just so secure in himself, like, it just, he pulls it off. And it's that thing of like, if you're confident in what you wear, you can pull it off. And this guy clearly fucking is. 
I'm assuming there's quite a few comments below us flooding in from the whiny man babies. Yeah, from the shit ass men who can't like, you know, stand to hear the word equality in a YouTube video, angrily typing out what I'm going to assume you're going to say now. You're reading too much into this. It's just a guy wearing a dress. That doesn't mean there is equality in the universe. So I will direct people's attention to the book, The Art of Star Trek, written in collaboration with like set dressers, people involved with Star Trek and more putting it, costume designers where they refer to the scant as a logical development in the universe of Star Trek, given that they don't give a fuck about near enough anything else. So obviously it's the logical development that in the future, gendered clothing would not be a thing, and it's based purely on personal preference, which obviously this guy fucking went, you know what, I'm going to rock a dress today in some leather boots. No one can fucking stop me. I'm pretty sure this is actually a common theme in Star Trek. Like, yeah. They always try and emphasise equality amongst the crew and the uh, people. Yeah, it's uh, something that goes all the way back to the very origins of Star Trek itself. Like With Gene Roddenberry like famously insisting that the cast of the original Star Trek series be racially diverse and like you know contain both men and women to show that in the universe humanity has got past like you know the petty squabbles we have today. To like work together for the greater good, which is exploring the galaxy and fucking all the aliens. As much as they try to push for complete equality, there's a few bits where they stumble a bit. Yeah, because the show is a product of its time, and my favourite example of that being the episode where Kirk gets swapped into a woman's body. And despite the fact the woman still has Captain Kirk's brilliant tactical mind and expertise and all of his memories and skills and experiences, like, Kurt becomes completely incompetent because he's in a woman's body. And by the same logic, the woman doesn't know how to handle the man's body. And it's like, yeah, that's not ideal. And I think as well, there's another great one. I think it's Red Letter Media pointed it out, where as the women got older, they put, like, literally Vaseline over the lens so you can't see the wrinkles. <laughs> Obviously, you can't show women ageing in this TV show. So they did, like, stumble somewhat, but I appreciate the effort being made. And the famous thing that they did is like the first interracial kiss on television between Uhara and Kirk um, almost didn't make it to air. Why did it almost not make it to air? Because apparently NBC were wary about including a kiss between a black woman and a white man in the show out of fear it would upset people. I was going to put it out there, NBC, if you're worried that you're going to upset literal racists, you should probably like, you know, take stock of what you're doing with your life. Because if you are actively counting racists as part of your audience and then trying to placate them with the content you put out, maybe you shouldn't do that. Because that's not like something that's going to be looked back fondly upon by like, you know people in the future. And it was saved because um, I forget like William Shatner and Nichelle Nichols, like you know Kirk and Uhara, they knew that NBC were like wary about everyone. You know what? We're going to fuck up every single take that doesn't have us absolutely macking the fuck out. So they have no choice but to air us kissing. And that's obviously the shot that aired. And for most people, that's where this story ends. But I was really interested in it, so I did a bit of extra research. And you might be wondering, folks, though, did anyone actually complain? And yes, a single person did complain, according to people familiar with the matter. And it was a man from the South who was very angry about the kiss because he opposed the mixing of races. And that's awful, but... There is a silver lining because that guy included a little note at the end of his like angry letter saying, I oppose the mixing of races. This shouldn't be on television. By saying, then again, I can't really blame Kirk for wanting to hit that. <laughs> <laughs> so he simultaneously in this letter said, I oppose all mixing of the races, but Uhara's pretty hot and I can't blame Kirk for wanting to get all up in that. It's like, I don't even know what to call that. He's clearly, it's obviously, that guy is clearly racist, but at the same time, he's okay with it because Uhara is super hot. And he can't, like, obviously, Kirk is like a hot blooded male. He, like, he can't help himself around, like, you know, a woman like that. So I hate all the races unless they're hot. That's the thing, I oppose the mixing of races, but I do want to fuck them. It's like, what is that? <laughs> That's what Chris was like. Literally, NBC was so skittish about like, offending racists, and one of them got offended, and even he was kind of okay with it. <laughs> it's like, holy fucking shit. But let's move swiftly past that. Like, the comment section's angry enough. We've mentioned enough buzzwords that they hate already. So let's talk about something like, you know, whiny, insecure men hate even more than that, and that's baldness. Because even baldness is something people had an issue with being shown in Star Trek in a positive light. I'm pretty sure right now I can hear Patrick Stewart marching with confidence towards this conversation. Yes, like the earned swagger of a man who just has a dick three miles long. 
It really was perfect casting for him to be there in that role. I know, and it almost didn't happen, because apparently people working on the show behind the scenes, like during the casting phase, were like, well, Patrick Stewart, do you really want this guy? Like, a bald captain? Would, like, does a bald man really command respect? Like, you know, have an air of authority about him? And there's the famous picture that you can put behind me now, when Patrick Stewart, like, wore a wig when he went in for his like initial audition that he apparently had to like order from England for when he did stage shows. <laughs> because like they told him like go in with a wig because they don't want a bald guy. And apparently he wore that wig during his initial audition and it went really badly. And then like obviously he went away and he took it off and someone started talking to him and realised, holy shit. Like you were uncomfortable in there wearing that wig wing like, yeah, like, I don't really like wearing a wig. And they go, just come back in and do it again without the wig. And he went and just absolutely fucking blew everyone away and went, you know what? Who gives a shit? You're, you're Captain Picard. But as you can imagine, some people had the same gut reaction to Patrick Stewart's casting as those executives did, and saying, like, you can't have a bald captain. And there's a great story told by Patrick Stewart himself about a time, like, Gene Roddenberry was at, like, a, a press event or something like that, and someone in the audience really smarmly asked him, it's like, so, about the casting of Patrick Stewart as Jean-Luc Picard, uh, don't you think in the 24th century they'd have come up with a cure for male pattern baldness? And Gene Roddenberry, without missing a shot, just looked him dead in the eye and just said, uh, by the 24th century, nobody would care. Presumably before dunking a basketball into a hoop that materialised 11 foot above that guy's head. And Patrick just said it's my favourite like, anecdote for, about Roddenberry because it's like, yeah, it really like, helped me feel like, you know, more confident in the role when I realised, like, yeah, no one would give a fuck. This is a world where they respect like, you know, wisdom and experience. And to bring all of this together... It makes sense, doesn't it? Because think about all the weird aliens like, that are encountered during Star Trek. It's like, Captain Kirk bangs women who are green, and NBC were worried about him, like, kissing a black woman. And then you fast forward, like, 20, 30 years in the future, and you've got Riker banging everything that moves, including an alien who is completely, like, from a race that is completely without gender. Riker, well, if he can't find a hole, he'll make a hole. <laughs> <laughs> Riker, and the thing as well, Riker even wears a dress in one episode. And I think there's, this is a great episode where he comes in and he wears a dress. And someone asks him about it, like, don't you feel weird when? He goes, no, this is the ceremonial dress of the people. I'll respect their customs. I have no qualms about wearing this. And then puts his leg up on someone and just stands like that. Yeah! Yeah, he's t I think it's the one where he's talking to Worf about it. Yeah. And as he's walking around, he turns around and says, besides, you look good in a dress. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. I fucking love that show. You'd think with how long it's been since the original Star Trek aired, people wouldn't still be trying to kowtow to, like, the racists in the audience. It's a very unusual concept that is still very relevant today. It's quite prevalent on YouTube itself. Like, not so much, like, like kowtowing to racists, but just not actively challenging them when you, sh you probably have a moral obligation to do that. Because you don't want to, like, you know, just kick the hornet's nest. And it's fair enough, like, anything for an easy life, but... From personal experience, we've said on this channel before, I think I've said direct to camera once, if you are racist and watch this channel, you can fuck off, I don't want your money. And we joked about it after the fact, didn't we? Like, that's the most non-controversial statement you've ever made. And we both, like, fun fact, both myself and Brad got complaints about that statement from people saying that um, it's not a very good idea. Yep. It's like, you know, antagonise your audience. And like, did you not hear what I said? If you are... Part of my honesty, and you are racist. I don't want your money. They're never people admitting to being racist. No. They're always people saying, oh, um, surely it's an issue to address your audience in such a way. It's like, so you're a racist then? No, I'm addressing a very specific part of the audience that I don't want to be part of my audience. <laughs> it's like, um, I think I... Uh, do you after the Doom... Like the video we mentioned, the Doom guy, who couldn't play Doom? Yeah. I got a lot of tweets after the fact of people saying, oh, thanks for bringing this to my attention. And it was all from like, people on like, like Gamergate shit. And some guy was like, oh yeah, like, here's a guy who's like, you know, shitting on games journalists. And I remember just reaching out and saying, my mockery of this one individual thing is not an endorsement of your shitty worldview. Please fuck off and die mad about it. <laughs> and that again pissed people off. And it's like, you can't piss off your audience. Like, it's like, if that's a part of my audience that's watching right now, stop watching my fucking videos. I don't want your money. I don't care. I do not care to know you. I would not want to interact with you in real life. Why would I want you to like, be able to interact with me in like, you know, this parasocial way? 
I remember you said to me once, when someone will comment on something of yours and the comment is a little bit suspect, yes. you'll go to their profile, yes. see if they follow anyone who has like questionable belief, yes. questionable beliefs. And if or, they do, or it's just like those people who are known for just being like, you know, like making intentionally incendiary comments to like, you know, appeal to the lowest common denominator, yeah. to just get people riled up and angry to make money. And someone said to me once, because um, I, I mentioned that, they said, why have, I, I, think, I don't think it was a why have I been blocked, I think they said why has a friend been blocked. And I yeah. said, it could like sometimes Carl will um, look at their profile and if they're following these kinds of people, he's not you, into Yeah, you can generally tell. It's like, oh, you can generally tell from the tweets they make. Like, I think I got one recently. And it was a guy who was, his, his entire feed was him hissing at Brie Larson and just railing against, like, you know, women in movies. And I thought, this is not a person that I'd ever care to interact with in real life. Why would I do it online? But this person I was messaging said to me, oh, how is it fair for him to judge someone based on the things he watches and likes? You, you mean the things that inform your personality? How dare he judge me on the things that form the basis of my personality and worldview? <laughs> It's like, what else am I supposed to judge you by? You got your profile picture's a fucking egg. It's like, what else have I got? Oh. Do you remember that one guy who um, we, you know how we occasionally do the videos on like the uh, the women in history have been awesome. Yes. Because you said, oh, I don't like the fact they often get shunned. Yes. We did one of them, and it was like the seventh or eighth one we did. I can't remember. And some guy commented on it saying, "Oh, I used to love fat female, but now it looks like you're pushing an agenda." I what was are like, talking about awesome shit. <laughs> yeah. And it was just a video about um, just a woman who did something cool. It's and the it's thing like, of, you're pushing an agenda. I don't like how you're so you're taking this like stance, and it's not fair, like trying to manipulate your audience like this. I just say, if your worldview is so fragile that just hearing about a woman like feels like a challenge to it, maybe you should like you know learn to grow the fuck up and like you know crib one of the lines from those kinds of people maybe you should move out of your safe space and stop being a snowflake <laughs> that's, that's the great was, um it's the pierce morgan pies yeah. thing yeah, it's like, yeah yeah pierce morgan kids today are too offended by things and he spent all day railing against a vegan sausage roll i do not understand the vegan sausage roll like because they weren't replacing it they added a new option to the menu for people who couldn't eat the sausage roll it's because they were calling it a sausage roll, isn't it? But sausage... Even though sausages, vegetarian sausages have existed yeah. for years. One of my favourite people like, online is a, a guy who plays fighting games called Sonic Fox, who is a black gay furry. <laughs> and if you don't know who he is, just that description alone is probably making a few people go... <sighs> because he is a competitive video game player who is black, gay and a furry. And he does not give a fuck. And the reason I love him is because he won the Trending Gamer Award or some shit like that. And he went on stage in a full fucking fursuit and said, I'm black, I'm gay, I'm a furry, I'm pretty much everything Republicans hate. And obviously, that statement pissed people off. But it led to the creation of this, one of my favourite memes I have ever seen. And it's the a picture of the Hindenburg. It says, unlike you liberals, I'm not so easily offended. And then below it, it's the Hindenburg exploding. It just says on it, why did the furry make fun of me? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, fucking okay, yes. It's like, oh, my, my, my. The, 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 to get into the mindset of those people, it's like, oh, everyone in the world is just like, it's like uh, this easily triggered snowflake who like can't accept any like you know challenge or criticism of their world view <laughs> just a quote from a guy in a fursuit sends me into a fucking frothing rage for like three days it's like so like, oh yeah i'm not so easily offended oh no a woman-led superhero movie's done well at the box office the what is the end of film as we know it <laughs> so, imagine just being that fucking shit at life that just little things like that just absolutely put you on tilt forever. And then imagine thinking that you're the one who is the logical one. Your reaction to a guy in a fursuit consoling you is to get pissed off about it. Oh, it's fun fucking task. It's like, I remember that quote so, so vividly because after it was made, someone went like, oh, why is he trying to force like, you know, politics into video games and i remember thinking to myself how poor is your media literacy if you can't see politics in media so i'm going to give a big pro tip to the people watching this who are angry at everything i've just said every piece of media you consume is political in some way and if you think it isn't it either agrees with your politics or your media literacy is shit and you should probably read a fucking book ah <laughs> oh oh it feels good oh yeah oh. 
So I rambled a bit there, but is anything I said actually all that controversial? It's more just pay more attention to the things you watch and read and don't be a fucking asshole. And someone out there right now, I am now their worst enemy. I am on like, I've been marked an SJW for life for that one. There'll be an Instagram account called Carl Smallwood insulted me. (laughs) It's so fucking shit. Oh man, it's like, the idea that people get so angry at this sort of thing, it makes me laugh and also cry a little bit on the inside. It does. It is funny how they try and like uh, adopt the word snowflake for people who are reacting far less than them. Yeah. Also, as well, it's a word coined by um, Tyler Durden in a movie deliberately made as a takedown of toxic masculinity. And they probably unironically think Tyler Durden is an ideal male role model, despite the fact it's written by a gay man to take down that idea of masculinity at all. <laughs> Fucking hell, man. Oh, it's, it's Also, I think the word SJW always cracks me up. It sounds like social justice warrior. And I, I, like, I've always found that like term like humorous because... Why is that an insult? Oh, you're fighting for, like, you know, social just like, and? Isn't that, like, isn't that a good thing? Isn't, like, isn't that another way of saying, like, you know, civil rights? Basically, you're just making a concerted effort for a more equal society for people of, like, all walks of life and backgrounds. And then you get made fun of for it. 